Thank you. Welcome to another Family Bible Study. Again, we're going to continue our study of Jeremiah chapter 11 to see once what God has to tell us today. Now, in verse 18, the whole temperature of the account changes dramatically because from our verse 18 to the end of the chapter, God is going to be dealing with Jeremiah or those who have the truth of what is going on and the consequence to them. Let's see once what the Bible says, what the role of the believer is. And I want to start with by going back to Colossians chapter 1 verse 24. Colossians chapter 1 verse 24, which is a very, very insightful statement that God gives us as to what our role is in the world, what our role is in the world. And we read there, who, uh, as it speaks about those who now rejoice, uh, that Paul is saying, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, isn't that a curious statement? You see, uh, it doesn't say, uh, we, gotta, uh, we know it can't be saying, that, there, that Christ's suffering at the cross was somehow incomplete and still had to be filled up. We know that's not possible. We know when Christ said, it is finished, as he hung on the cross, that was the completion, the totality of all that was required for, for the salvation of everyone that he had come to save. But what does the child of God, how do we relate to Christ? How do we relate to Christ? The Bible says we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. Christ went back to heaven. Now remember, he already in the three and a half years he was here, as we read in Luke 4, he is bringing the gospel. He is suffering as he brings the gospel. He, uh, the, uh, they, uh, uh, they want to kill him. Uh, and and uh, God does in detail all the ways in which they tried to make him suffer, but we have uh, we have the we have the general tone of what was going on. Now he went back to heaven. Was the task of bringing the gospel completed once he went back to heaven? No, it was only begun. It was only begun. It, that still had to be done. Now who came to bring the gospel? the Lord Jesus. But then Jesus went back to heaven. So he aborted his task. Sounds like. No, he didn't abort his task. He simply continued the task by his body, which are the true believers. Now do you see how we fill up the sufferings? In other words, the true believers, and this has to do with throughout the church age as well as through the time of the latter reign, as we bring the gospel, we are doing the work that Christ had been assigned to do. We are completing or filling up uh, the suffering that Christ has to endure in bringing the gospel. And, uh, and this, this is a principle that we have to keep in mind. Now, this, this incidentally is work that we do. We do. When the, the fact that he suffered at the cross, that was his work, 100%. The fact that we suffer as we bring the gospel, that is work that we do. But it has nothing to do with us becoming saved. It doesn't guarantee our salvation. It doesn't initiate salvation. It doesn't add to our salvation. It is simply the task of those who are born again that we uh, uh, even as Christ was perfect in his own be- in his being, so in our soul existence we have become perfect because that which is born of God cannot sin, and we complete the work that Christ did. Now, this, this becomes very, very uh, 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 f- uh, 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 factual. It's not, it's not just idle conversation. When we read in Matthew 10, for example, in Matthew chapter 10, we, we read there uh, you, you, uh, where God gives us some clues as to how we might suffer, how we might suffer as, uh, as we are the body of Christ, come filling up the suffering that Christ would still have to endure as he brought the gospel. 
we we read in uh, in uh, verse uh, 16. Behold, I send you forth. This is Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents. Incidentally, uh, when we think of that, we're not. It's not saying be wise as Satan, who is the serpent. No, that would be a wrong application. Who else is a serpent? Who else is a serpent? Who was raised on the on the on the uh, pole, and they, they had to look at him in order to be healed of their of their of their snake bites? The Lord Jesus, yeah, the the brass serpent, remember, and the brass serpent, the fiery serpent, and that would have to be the serpent that God is talking about represented God as the judge. In other words, we could paraphrase this, therefore be ye therefore wise as God himself as the judge of all the earth, as he was typified by the fiery serpent that was hung on the pole that we read about in John 3 and back there in the Old Testament, and harmless as doves. In other words, we turn the other cheek, we do not come with swords or guns, or like the Crusaders were going, uh, did when they wanted to uh, somehow rescue Jerusalem, uh, and uh, we're going to do it by brute force. No, no, we are harmless as doves. And who is the dove that we are, uh, that God has in view? The Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit descended upon Christ as a dove when Christ was baptized, and so we come, we come uh, uh, with the. With the perfection, actually, that word harmless is is that, that we come with no sin. We come uh, faithfully, faithful to the to the Bible. Uh, but then it, 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 it describes the and and God is very very uh, uh, open about this. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and will scourge you in their synagogues. You shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And it goes on in, uh, in uh, verse 21. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. Remember Jeremiah and his, uh, and his family in Anathoth? Uh, this is speaking directly of that. His own family wants him killed. Let's destroy the, the tree, uh, that there will be no fruit of any kind. And... Uh, and let's let's end this kind of betrayal that is going on. The brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. And the children shall rise up against the parents and cause them to be put to death. Uh, and and uh, uh, and ye shall be hated of all for my name's sake. Why this antagonism? Why this enormous hatred? Well, of course. But we can understand that very readily because there are only two kingdoms in the world, spiritually speaking. On the one hand, there's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus, and on the other hand, there's the kingdom of Satan. And is Satan the friend of the Lord Jesus? No, he is absolutely the sworn enemy against Christ. He wanted Christ killed, and so all those who are slaves of Satan, who are in bondage to him... They also want Christ killed. They, they, uh, whether they do it, uh, whether they want this uh, 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 knowingly uh, or whether it's just subconsciously, but ultimately they want Christ killed. They don't want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And so where is their hatred coming against? I often think, you know, when I'm on the open forum, I, someone will call with a, uh, very passionately and, uh, very angrily, uh, very angrily, uh, uh, calling names, uh, and frankly, I can honestly say I, I understand completely. It doesn't trouble me at all. But actually, you know, what's happening is when people are trying to kill or trying to silence the true gospel, they're really lashing out at God. They they don't want God to say what he is saying. But you can't attack God. He's up there in heaven. He's the spirit. So who do they attack? They attack those who represent God, who come with the message of God. They, they, 
they can't kill the message, so they try to kill the messenger. Uh, but their their enmity is in the first instance is against God. They really uh, and but they have to find somebody who they think is a is a faithful representative of God, and that's the one they're going to attack. And of course, once we understand that. We can we can absorb these uh, these uh, darts of Satan without any trouble because we know it's, uh, they don't hate me personally. It isn't that. It isn't that they want me killed. It is that they want this gospel silence. They are against God altogether. And and frankly, uh, well, let's let's go on. And so God has something else to say here. We read in in verse uh, 24. Uh, 20, uh, 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 well, uh, let's first read 23 a moment in Matthew 10 while we're in this passage. And when they persecute you in this city, flee ye to another. For verily I say, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And the sense of this is that the task of bringing the gospel will only be finished when Christ comes. And as long as the task of bringing the gospel goes on, this is the setting in which it is going to be going. There's going to be animosity. There are going to be those who, who absolutely do not want to hear that, that truth. They are in, in uh, uh, total denial themselves, and, and uh, they do not want to listen. They don't want anybody to be talking about these kinds of things. Now, in verse 24, God gives a principle. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the, the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, that is another name for Satan, how much more shall they call them of his household? You see, uh, this is a principle that God lays down. Okay. You've, you've come into the kingdom of God. You have entered into a kingdom that is that, that the, uh, the other kingdom, the kingdom of Satan, hates with a passion. And because you've come into the kingdom of God, now you are going to uh, receive the darts and, his, and the sword thrusts and the lance bl- uh, blows of the, the, club, the clubbing of the, of the kingdom of Satan because they, the, because the kingdom of Satan is headed up by Satan, who hates Christ with a passion and wants him dead. He wants him out of the way if he possibly could, so that he can be the final winner. And and now you, as a servant of the Lord Jesus, are going to endure exactly the same thing. And you know, when we read these verses, this is an enormous encouragement to us, because it simply tells us, well, you know, God, God had it all laid out. He... he this, this is not something that's unexpected. This isn't something that, you know, Jeremiah is back there and he is uh, physically enduring these kind of things. Uh, they want to physically kill him. Uh, and uh, he doesn't have Matthew chapter 10. God has not written that yet. He doesn't have as much information by any means that we have. But when we have uh, when we see Jeremiah in his in his uh, struggle there, as God is beginning through him to teach these principles, because that is the principle. These principles are what are coming out of Jeremiah 11. Uh, the fact is here in uh, in uh, Matthew 10, uh, uh, we have a, a, gr- a great expansion of truth, a great uh, explanation of what really is going on, so that we need not be surprised. Uh, we, we in our day have a piece of cake, really, because uh, physically we don't, we don't suffer because of this normally. There are a few people in the world who do get martyred in our day, certainly. Yes, that is true. But it wasn't anything like day, during the Reformation, for example, when thousands, literally thousands, uh, were burned at the stake because they wanted to have a copy of the Bible, because they uh, wanted to read the Bible for themselves. And it's, uh, it's beyond our imagination, the, the murderous activity that was going on. And yet, and yet, I, I, for them too, for them too, 
uh, you know, the wonder of it all. When, when we uh, are attacked physically, physically, and, and the ultimate attack is to bring about our death, although it may be uh, 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 somewhat physically painful if there's torture that goes before that, and frequently that was the case in the past. Uh, and yet, when we die physically, what wonderful thing happened? At the moment we died, we went to be with the Lord. And could anything be more wonderful? Could anything have a happier ending? You know, we read about Cinderella or some of these these fairy tales, and she had nothing, and she ended up marrying the beautiful prince. Uh, and what a happy ending to a very sordid beginning because she was despised by her sisters and so on. I tell you, that's nothing. That's nothing, nothing compared with the happy ending that comes to us as believers. No matter how terrible it is, we have the happy ending of, uh, and it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed that we end up with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven forevermore. And so, uh, I, I, and the fact is, you know, if they call the master of the house Beelzebub, and again, becoming very practical, well, uh, getting very practical in the days of Jeremiah, uh, when he was saying we have to give in to the Babylonians, we have to uh, be allowed to be taken captive, we are not to fight against them, that was absolute betrayal. That was contrary to everything that that he should have been saying, insofar as the princes and uh, and those who were uh, who were protecting the city were concerned, uh, and and so uh, they have effectively were called, were thinking of him in the worst terms possible. And I'll tell you, when we when we tell our loved ones and our friends that. We must come out of the congregation. We are, uh, to them, they honestly think that we are speaking like Satan. That we are, that Satan has taken over. Because doesn't Satan, doesn't he want to destroy the church? Doesn't he want to destroy the church? Yes, he does. And he's pretty, been pretty successful in destroying the local congregations. Because remember when we looked at the parable of the wheat and tares, we saw that all through the New Testament history, era. Unbeknownst to us, we had never really thought a whole lot about that. That had never really been emphasized, at least not in, if from any quarters that I'm aware of or in any, the, uh, in any direction that I uh, could know. Uh, but the fact is, the church was being seeded by uh, those who were under the authority of Satan and who appeared as if they had become true believers, Satan quietly was taking over. And finally, finally, it looks like he won because Christ abandoned the church and abandoned, uh, told the true believers to get out. So what's left are those who belong to Satan, basically, unless there's still a few there that are elect and will eventually come out. Uh, and... and uh, and now Satan has won. Satan has been the victor. And uh, uh, so, but now God says in verse 26 of Matthew 10, Matthew 10, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness that speak ye in light and what ye hear in the ear that preach ye upon the housetops. You see, I, uh, God gives us his word. This is where truth is. This is where truth. If we did not have the Bible, I say this again and again, if we did not have the Bible, we would not know where what, what was going on. We would not know whether we were, to use the phrase, afoot or horseback. We would uh, have absolutely no... Uh, uh, we would be concerned as we see the... A breakdown in do biblical doctrine, we would be concerned about the way the music is changing. We would be concerned about this and concerned about that. And and yet uh, we would ha think, my, my, uh, this is God's, look, this is God's church. He established this. How can this, what can happen? And uh, maybe we have to work harder to try to clean, uh, clean house. Maybe 
we have to uh, try to uh, get another pastor and get uh, uh, maybe we ought to break away and start another congregation and that has been done of course repeatedly throughout the church age as one method of continuing uh, God's usage of the local congregations but God has given us the whole truth God has allowed us to get the perspective exact of exactly what is happening. Look, this is my plan. There will come a time when I am finished with the local congregations and that methodology of sending out the gospel. There will come a time when the church will be turning more and more away from the truth of the word of God and and, and making their own doctrines uh, uh, to be followed. And, and, uh, and uh, 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 this is the way I'm going to do this. I want you to leave the congregation. And there's going to be a tremendous harvest of souls that's going to be coming in outside of the congregations. I have given you the truth. And that's why he says in verse 27, What I tell you in darkness, speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, Preach ye upon the housetops. And in other words, our task is not to ask why. Our task is to simply obey. Do what God has declared. There's a, a, a Tennyson or one of these poets have said, "'Tis not to reason why, tis but to do or die.'" And that is not a biblical uh, verse at all, but it's a biblical pr- principle that we simply obey God because God does everything perfect. God does everything right. And and, and in verse 28, he gives us this assurance. And fear not them which kill the body, but are able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, it gets right back to the fundamental issue the fundamental issue, what is more important, the protection of my physical existence for now or the protection of my spiritual existence for eternity? And the fact is that we can protect ourselves for now. We can, we can deny Christ and therefore not go to the burning stake. We can, we can throw in the towel and say, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. When I talk about leaving the church, I get so much criticism. I, uh, it becomes so destructive in my family. I, I can't teach that anymore. Well, fine. You can do that. You're protecting your physical existence right now. But how do you stand with God? Are you being obedient to God? And that's the bottom line. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a fundamental principle in life. And that is that if, if you want to make sure you're doing the right thing, do it God's way, no matter how difficult it may appear to do, to be. That is the only way to go. And, and now just one other, uh, to, to indicate how this gets right into the family. And it's in the family where, where it can be the most intense. That was Jeremiah's problem with his family in Anathoth. In verse 34, think not that I, Jesus is saying, am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. And, uh, you know, it's, this, these, this passage is so practical. It is so real. It is so, uh, we see it in, in uh, such clear evidence as the more we are faithful to the Word of God, the more we are faithful to the Word of God. And, and in other words, as we, as we do it God's way, we, we find that it's destructive to our family. And this happens everywhere. And we say there's something wrong here. Where if we're doing it God's way, we ought to build our family. But the, here, this is the problem right here, that we're, that we, that, uh, uh, God has already anticipated this because of these two kingdoms. Now, we'll develop that a little bit more in our next study. 